Uh, Almighty Father, thank you for this opportunity to come here today and to hear your word be preached. Uh, please bless, Pastor. Please bless the message. Open our hearts and our uh, ears to your words and help us keep distractions to a minimum. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're there in uh, 1 Peter chapter number 3. And I'd like to uh, bring your attention down to just one verse. And we've already seen it. It was in our bulletin. Uh, verse number 15, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15, the Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And here's a part that I want to, to, you, for you to look at. It says, And be ready. You see those words there? Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And uh, the Bible tells us that we are to be ready when people question us about certain things and certain doctrines, certain things that we believe. We are to be ready to give an answer. And you know, something that I've, uh, that I, I've learned since we've had these protesters out here, uh, and I've been getting a lot of voicemails and emails by so-called Christians, and I use the term very loosely, but I've been, uh, something I've learned, and I already knew this, but it's just become even more apparent, is that there are a lot of Christians out there who just believe a lot of stupid things. And it, excuse, excuse my, uh, you know, the word stupid there, you may not like that word, and I don't, I, don't, I could use a Bible word like brood or something like that, but, um, and it's not that, and, and, and really I'm not upset at Christians, I'm more upset at pastors, because a lot of times Christians believe stupid things because they've been taught stupid things. And, and maybe you've even been taught some things that are not really found in Scripture. And I, I, I've been getting a lot of calls and people will throw out these, these things, you know, and they'll say, well, what about this? And what about that uh, in regards to our position and the protests and all these things? And uh, this morning, I, I want to just try to debunk some of those things. And I want to try to help teach you because some of you are being asked these questions. You have stupid Christian friends who are asking you stupid questions, and, and you know they're wrong, but maybe you're not exactly sure how to answer. And I want to try to help you answer that this morning. I want to give you, uh, 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 really, the sermon is entitled this morning, Stupid Things That Christians Believe. And I don't know how else to title it or how else to say it. I'm not trying to be offensive to you. But I want to try to help you understand that a lot of the things that are being taught today are just not found in Scripture. They're not what the Bible says. Now, here's the thing. I'll be honest with you. You can't cover all the stupid things Christians believe in one sermon. Okay? Okay? This could be like a series, and maybe it will be a series. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how I feel next week. But I want to give you just some, some real, so it, it, I'm just, I would encourage you to take notes, write these statements down, and write down the references, go to the references, because some of you are being asked these questions. And I want to help you be able to have, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. And some of you are being asked questions by Christians who just don't read the Bible, who just don't know the Bible. And I want to try to help you with that this morning, okay? Here's, here's the, the, the first one, and they're not in any particular order for any reason. Uh, they're just, uh, it's just how I decided to go with it. But here's something that, keeps, that people keep uh, throwing at me is, isn't all sin equal? You know, and they'll say, like, doesn't the Bible teach that all sin is equal? And let me make this statement. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible ever teach that all sin is equal. In fact, the, the, the closest thing that they can come to it is found in James chapter number 2. And I want you to, uh, to let's look at it together. You're there in 1 Peter. If you go one, back, one book over, you're going to go uh, to James. Go to James chapter number 2. And let's look at the passage that people refer to and re and in order to say, like, isn't all sin equal? Because when we get up and we preach against the sodomite agenda today, and people say like, well, you guys are just making too big of a deal about it. Isn't all sin equal? You know, isn't the sin of sodomy just like any other sin? And, and here's the thing. No, the answer is no. All sin is not equal. The Bible doesn't teach that. And let me start by going to the verse that people like to use to try to prove that and show you how the Bible doesn't teach that. James chapter 2, look at verse number 10. Notice what the Bible says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, this verse, people will take this verse and say, see, if you break the law at any point, it's all the same. Now, hold on a second. That's not what it says. Show me in this verse where God says, all sin is equal, all sin is the same. Here's what it says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law. He's saying, if you think you're going to get to heaven by keeping the entire law, and yet you offend in one point, he says, you break God's law. He says, here's what he's saying. It doesn't matter which 
point you break God's law at, you become guilty of all. You say, well, why is that? Look at verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Here's what he's saying. The same God who said, thou shalt not bear false witness, is the same God that said, thou shalt not kill. He said, the same God that said, thou shalt not commit adultery, is the, is the same God that said, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He's saying, it's, it's, it doesn't matter where you break God's law, you're sinning and transgressing against the same God. And here's all this verse is teaching, is that any sin is enough to send you to hell. No one's good enough to go. You can say, well, I'm a pretty good person. All I've ever done, my whole entire life, all I've ever done is I told one lie. And here's the thing, that's enough to send you to hell. That's what this verse is, is teaching. That's what this verse is, 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 is showing us. You know, show me where in this passage you can make the word say that the Bible is teaching that all sin is equal. You can't find it. I mean, let's read it. For whosoever shall keep the whole lot and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Am I missing something there? What does it say? And by the way, all sin is the same. It doesn't say that. It just says if you break it at any point. It's like if you broke it at any other point because you're sinning against the same God, you're guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, here's why this is important, all right? Uh, go with me to the book of, of, of John in, in the New Testament there. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You say, well, is it, that, is it that big of a deal if people say that all sin is equal? It's a huge deal, and here's why. If we begin to teach that all sin is equal, we are basically calling the Lord Jesus Christ a liar. You say, why is that? Because Jesus taught the exact opposite. Jesus did never taught that all sin was equal. In fact, he taught the opposite. Let me show it to you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you can find John chapter number 19 and look at verse number 10. And look, so you need to write these statements down. You need to write these references down. If you say, maybe you're here this morning, you say, well, I think all sin is equal. I'm not mad at you. I'm not against you. I'm not your enemy. But look, don't just ignore these verses. You got to answer these verses. Because this is what I've noticed. People, I'll preach sermons like the one last week about the law. And then people are just like, they, they completely ignore everything I said. And they're like, well, what about this one thing? And it's like, no, no. You know, I, I used to give people the benefit of the doubt. Like, oh, maybe they just don't understand it. Maybe they don't. I, I'm starting to realize a lot of times when people don't understand something, it's because they don't want to understand it. It's because they just don't want to deal with it. And I'm tired of it. You know, I'm to a point where I'm like, we're not going to talk about that till you answer this verse. You explain this verse to me. Are you there in John 19? Then saith Pilate unto him. Remember, Jesus was, was uh, brought before Pilate. And Pilate is saying to, Je to Jesus, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And I uh, have power to release thee? Jesus was exercising his Fifth Amendment right. He was not speaking to Pilate. And Pilate says, Speakest thou not unto me? That's where our Fifth Amendment right comes from, by the way. Jesus was exercising his right to not, you know, to, to basically remain silent, to not, uh, uh, you know, say anything that's going to be used against you. Look at verse 11. Jesus answered. So he decides, because uh, up to this point, he's been giving Pilate the silent treatment. But then Jesus decides to say something, because here's what Pilate says. Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify? Pilate says, don't you know that I have power over you? I can crucify you. I have power to release thee. Look at verse 11. Jesus answered, thou couldn't have no power. Now look, do you, if you have a red letter edition Bible, these verses are in red. You know why? Because this is Jesus speaking. Notice what Jesus says. Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except they were given thee from above. Therefore, now notice what Jesus says. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee. All right. Pilate's a Roman. Pilate, Jesus being delivered up to the Romans. But who delivered him to the Romans? The Jews. Now notice what he says. He that delivereth me unto thee hath the, let's read the next two words together, greater sin. Okay, so let me ask you a question. According to Jesus, is there a such thing? Look, they're both sinning, Pilate and the Jews. They're both doing the same thing. But Jesus says, the Jews who delivered me unto you, they have the greater sin. So according to Jesus, is there a such thing as some sins being greater than others? Amen. Then look. All sin is equal is a dumb statement. It's a stupid statement. It's a stupid belief. And all these Christians that are calling and saying, I can't believe you would say that about the homos. Isn't all sin equal? No, it's not equal. Jesus said himself, he said, hey, there are some people that have greater sins than other sins. Amen. Jesus said there's no such thing as a greater sin. And here's what's interesting about that. Because people normally are throwing that out 
in regards to the to the sodomite agenda. But well, you know, let me give you let me give, before I even go there. Let me give you a couple more statements. Go go to the book of Exodus. In the Old Testament, you got Genesis, Exodus. Now, here's the question: If you believe, if you believe all sin is equal, okay, don't ignore that verse. Answer that verse. Then was Jesus wrong when he said that the Jews have the greater sin, that they have a worse sin, that their sin is worse than the sin of Pilate? You got to answer it. You got to answer it. Go to the book of Exodus, Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Genesis, Exodus should be fairly easy to find, second book in the Bible. Exodus 21. Let me just give you a couple, uh, two examples to show just that God never taught this in the Bible. Notice what the Bible says, says in Exodus 21, 16. And he that stealeth a man. Okay, what's it mean to steal a man? That's kidnapping. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand. So it doesn't matter if, if, if you capture the, the kidnapper and he has the person they kidnap, or if you capture the kidnapper and they've already sold the person they have. Notice what the Bible says. He shall surely be put to death. You know, did you know that God put the death penalty on kidnapping? You know, you say, well, we don't, we don't do that today. I, you know, here's the thing. I bet you in America, if they put the death penalty on kidnapping, there'd be a lot less kids getting kidnapped. Amen. Amen. Are you inciting violence against kids? Shut up. All right? No. I'm, all I'm saying is God put the death penalty on kidnapping. I'm, I'm sick and tired of these liberals. And by the way, let me just explain them to you. I, I, you know, I tried. I tried to be nice to the liberals. I tried to bring them in here. I tried to be their friend. I tried to put them in position of leadership. It didn't work out. You know, you can't make a liberal quit being a liberal. Okay, so I'm done with it. Amen. You know, I'm just, I'm done with trying to help liberal people. If you don't like what we're saying, just leave. Amen. But look, he, God says, if you steal a man in his Old Testament law, in his uh, government, he said he shall surely be put to death. All right? That's how bad of a sin can, I mean, could you imagine someone taking your child? I mean, sneaking into your house in the middle of the night and taking your child, I couldn't imagine a worse thing. You know, uh, uh, and God said, that's bad. God said, let's put death penalty. Now, let me give you another example. Go to Exodus 22, look at verse 1. Let's see, let's see somebody else stealing. Because in Exodus 21, 16, we saw if he that stealeth a man. All right? Now, look at Exodus 22, 1. If a man shall steal an ox. All right? So, same is stealing, but now you're stealing an ox. Or a sheep and kill it, or sell it. Notice what the Bible says. He shall restore five oxen for an ox, and four sheep for a sheep. Now look, that's a different punishment. You steal a man, you get put to death. You steal a kid, you get put to death. You steal an ox, or a sheep, you got to restore it. You got to pay it back fivefold, or fourfold. Here's the point I'm trying to make. God puts different levels of punishment in His government for different sins because all sins are equal. Do you understand that? Go to the book of Genesis 13. Genesis chapter number 13. Now let me say this. And, and honestly, just think of it logically. If you really think that a child walking into a 7-Eleven and stealing a piece of gum is equal to a grown man, you know, raping and killing children... If you think those two things are equal, you are insane. Amen. You are crazy. You need to get, you, they need to put one of those jackets on you and put you in a padded room and lock you away from society. That is insane. I mean, people say, all sin is equal. All sin. How in the world is all sin equal? I steal a, 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 a stick of gum. I go and kill a bunch of people. It's the same thing before God. No, it's not. Amen. The Bible never teaches that anywhere. Now, can all sin send you to hell? Absolutely, I believe that. If, 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 can you break any part of God's law and that will send you to hell? Absolutely. Is all sin equal? No. And here's what's funny. Go to Genesis 13. People will often, they'll bring this up when you're preaching against the homos. Well, all sin is equal. You're a liar. So that makes you an equal to an unnatural reprobate? But, but here's what's interesting. Jesus, the Bible himself, the God himself, about... The sin of sodomy. Notice what he says, Genesis 13, 13. But the men of Sodom, this is God speaking, but the men of Sodom. Now, do you know why homosexuality, the biblical word is sodomy? It's called sodomy because the men in Sodom were doing it. That's where the term comes from. Okay, so, just, so we're talking about the sin of homosexuality. Notice what he says. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners 
before the Lord, let's read it together, exceedingly. Okay, was their sin equal to other sins? No. In fact, the Bible says that the sin of the men of Sodom was, here's what the word exceedingly means, to an unusual degree. It was to an extreme. God doesn't pick up fire from hell and pour it upon a nation because they're stealing gum. God doesn't pick up fire from hell and destroy an entire group of people because they got a bat because they have a potty mouth. God decided to pick up fire from hell and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin was exceeding. And today people say, well, I don't think you should say that. Then you have a problem with the Bible. Amen. You don't have a problem with me. The only problem you have with me is that I'm preaching the Bible. Is that you actually ran into a preacher who actually teaches and preaches the Bible. Amen. Who actually believes what the Bible says. But look, what are you going to do? The, people say, you know, and somebody says to you, well, isn't all sin equal? I, can't, I saw your pastor on the news. Isn't all sin equal? Take him to these verses. Say, well, wh what about this? Well, I just, no, no, no. Answer Genesis 13, 13. No, answer Exodus 21, 6. Answer Exodus 22. Answer what Jesus said about the greater sin. Answer these questions because we can't let these people just get away with making stuff up anymore. You know, is all sin equal? No, all sin is not equal. I don't care who teaches that. I don't care who preaches that. I don't care how many federal Baptists say, well, I heard that at a big con. I don't care. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, specifically about the sin of Sodom, God said and God's word says that they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly to an extreme, to an unusual degree. So number one this morning, Stupid things that you're stupid Christians who go to stupid churches. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be using that word that much. My wife's like, you know, our kids aren't allowed to say that word. Okay. You know, here, here's, the, here's the statements they make. All sin is equal. It's not true. It's just not found in the Bible. Let me, give, let, me, let me give you the second one. Number two, God never gives up on anyone. Well, God never gives up on anyone. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look, I'm sorry to confuse you with the Bible. But you, you've, got, you've got to realize that what mainstream Christianity believes and what the Bible teaches are two different things. Amen. And people come up to me and they're like, well, my friend said that. Your friend goes to a church where he, he's, your friend's not even saved, number one. Your, his pastor's not saved. He's reading out of the NIV. I mean, good night. You know, here's what you need to understand. Mainstream Christianity is a pagan religion today in America. Amen. They say they're Christians. They say they believe the Bible. They don't know. They, they wouldn't know the Bible if it hit them. Amen. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 22. Notice what the Bible says. Well, God never gives up on anybody. Okay, well, answer me this. Matthew 12, 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he, this is Jesus speaking. You can look it up in its context if you'd like. Healed him. And so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, All the people said, This must be the son of David. And the Pharisees said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So they said, This guy is not the, this guy is a devil. This guy has a devil. This guy is just casting out devils by the prince of the devil. That's what the Pharisees said to Jesus. Just for sake of time, skip down to verse 27. I would encourage you to read the whole chapter in its context, but look at verse 27. Notice what Jesus responds. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. You're never supposed to judge. That's one I wasn't able to get to. Look at verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is not come unto you. Look at verse 31, just for sake of time. Wherefore I say unto you, notice this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, right? Because the people said, they were amazed, this is the son of David. The Pharisees said, no, this is Beelzebub. This guy's casting out devils by the prince of the devils. Notice what Jesus says to them, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner, the word manner means all kinds. It says, all kinds of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But, well, doesn't Jesus forgive all sin? Doesn't he, doesn't he, doesn't God, he never gives up on anybody. Hold on a second. Let's see what Jesus said. All kinds, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall, don't miss this, not. Do you see that word not? shall not be forgiven unto men. God forgives all sin. Well, he doesn't forgive this one. God never gives up on anybody. Well, he gave up on these people. I mean, are you listening to what I'm saying? Well, Jesus is love. I know you were taught that. And Jesus is love. 
But guess what? God and Jesus give up on people sometimes. I mean, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And just to make it clear, notice what he says in verse 32. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. By, but, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall, notice, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. I mean, how, more, how clear could you be about the subject? So I just don't think you should be saying that about the homos. I'm not talking about the homos. I'm talking about the Pharisees. I'm just saying, God. at some point, God gives up on people. Look, when, when the Bible says, and is it appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment, you die in your sin without receiving Christ, God gives up on you too. At, there comes a point where, where, where grace is no longer extended. And for, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the only question I'm asking for the Christian. God never gives up on anybody. Here's the question I have. Did Jesus give up on the Pharisees when he said, your sin that you just committed, it will not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. Did he, did he give up on them? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So, well, that's just the Pharisees, or that's just one example. Okay, let's give you another example. Go to Matthew 13. Look at verse number 10. Matthew 13. That was specifically the Pharisees that said that, but let's talk about just the Pharisees in general or the Jews as a religion. You know, did God give up on the Jews? Has, has there been a change from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Matthew 13, look at verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, unto Jesus, they asked him a question. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Remember all those parables? Here's what's funny. All the liberal churches, they love the series on the parables. And I, I you know, a series on parables is great. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. One of these days we'll do a series on the parables. But, you know, here's the question that I have. Why do we have these great parables that Jesus gave? I mean, these wonderful stories. Why do we have them? Well, the, the disciples asked Jesus that. They said, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Notice what Jesus says, verse 11. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you, don't, don't miss this, it is given unto you, you should underline this in your Bible, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Because remember, Jesus would give the parable to a crowd, and then he would take his disciples aside, and he would expound upon the parable, and he would explain the parable. All right, the parable to the crowd, everyone's scratching their head and they're like, what's that thing about the seed and the sower? And the, I, I don't understand. And then Jesus would take his disciples and I said, let me explain it to you. All right, now notice what Jesus said. Look, look at verse 11. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. What is not given? It is not given to them to know. He says, I don't want them to know what you know. I mean, are you, are you following what I'm saying? Well, this is just not the Jesus that I was taught. Joel Osteen never said this. I know, because Joel Osteen wants your money. Because Joel Osteen doesn't want to be on the news for, for pre actually preaching the Bible. Look at verse 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever uh, hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Look at verse 13. Therefore, what's the word therefore mean? It means for this reason. For what reason? Because it's given to you to know, and it's not given unto them to know, because I want you to know, because I want some people to know, and I don't want others people to know. Look at verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables. You want to know why I talk to them in parables? Because I've already given up on them. I don't even want them to know. I don't even want them to understand. They had an, it's not that they didn't have an opportunity. We'll get that, to that in a minute. It's not that they didn't have an opportunity, but they've already lost their opportunity, therefore, I don't want them to know. It's not given to them to know. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 13. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because, notice, because they seeing, see not. Now look, do they have the ability to see? Yes. But do they see? No. It's not that they can't see. They can see, but they see not. All right? And hearing, they hear not. It's not that they can't hear. It's not that they couldn't hear what was preached. Not that they couldn't see what Jesus was doing. They had the ability to hear. They had the ability to see, but they chose not to see. We'll see that in a second. They chose not to hear. Neither do they understand. Look at verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah talked about this all the way in the Old Testament about the Jews, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxen gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, don't miss this, their eyes they have closed. Who closed their eyes so that they could not see? They did. 
You understand that? We're not teaching Calvinism here. Are you saying that God chooses? No, no. Everyone has the opportunity to see and to hear the gospel. But if they choose to close their eyes, God says, well, then that's between them. That's their choice. And there comes a point where you reject it enough that he says, I don't even want you to understand. No, don't, don't miss it. Look at verse 15. For this people's heart is wax and gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. You see this word last? You should underline. You should circle that word last. You know what the word last means? It means unless. Or so that they should not. He said, unless, he said, last at any time. He said, you, you're asking me why I speak in parables. Here's why I speak in parables. Just in case, unless at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts, don't miss this, and should be converted. Did you just catch what Jesus said? Jesus said, I'm speaking in parables because you know what? They shut their eyes. They seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not. But he said, you know, just in case, just in case, I don't want, them. he said, they've lost their opportunity. He said, I've already given up on them. He said, they're already done. Just unless, unless they might hear and believe, he said, and should be converted. Do you understand that Jesus just said, I don't want these people to be converted? I don't want these people to get saved. They had their opportunity. They had their chance. They rejected it. They rejected it. And he says, the opportunity is done. That's why I speak in parables. And should us be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed, notice, notice the difference. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. I mean, how clear is that? God never gives up on anybody. Did he give up on these people? Looks like he gave up on them. Go to Acts, Acts 28. You're there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts 28. I won't expound on Acts 28 too much. We'll just read it again. It's another quote from Isaiah. It's another uh, illustration about the Jews. Notice Acts 28. Look at verse 25. When you get to Acts, do me a favor. Keep your place there because we're going to leave it and we're going to come right back to it. Okay, so make sure you can get back to Acts quickly. Acts 28. Look at verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our father, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. So notice they did see, but they didn't perceive. They did hear, but they didn't, uh, they didn't hear. Verse 27, for the, the heart of this people is wax and gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. He's quoting Isaiah, same verses. And notice, their eyes they have closed. They shut their eyes. They shut their ears. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. He says, I don't want them to see. I don't want them to hear. I don't want them to be healed. Notice verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Notice he said, I'm done with the Jews. They keep rejecting. He's talking about the Jews as a people. Obviously an individual Jew can believe and be saved. But he's saying, you know what? We're done. We're done with the Jews. We're going to the Gentiles, and we're actually going to be talking about that tonight if you're interested about how that works and, you know, are the Jews still God's chosen people? We're actually dealing with that tonight in our Patriarch series in, in uh, Genesis, so I'd encourage you to be here for that if you have questions about that. Keep your place in Acts, all right? We're going to come right back to it. Go to Revelation, Revelation 14. We're, 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 as, you know, we're asking the question because the, the, the liberal Christians say, well, God never gives up on anybody. Okay, well, we saw that he gave up on uh, those who blaspheme the Holy Ghost in Matthew chapter 12. We saw that he gave up on the Jews in Matthew 13 and Acts 28. Let's, give, let's see another example where God gives up on people. Revelation 14, look at verse 9. Revelation 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Now, this is the book of Revelation, so this is end times prophecy. Keep that in mind. This is future events. If any man worship the beast and his image, the beast is the Antichrist, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Remember the mark? 666, right? He says, if any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, notice, the same shall drink. Anyone who takes the mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of the torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and notice, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Did you, do you understand what he just said? If you're not saved, because no believer, the Bible tells them, imagine before, no believer will take the mark of the beast. That's very clear in Scripture. 
But if you're not saved and you take the mark of the beast, you have sealed your fate. You've lost your opportunity for salvation. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So did God give up on these people? Looks like he did. Looks like God gives up on a lot more people than uh, Christians like to talk about or think about. Go to Revelation 22. Look at verse 18. Let me give you another example. Revelation 22, verse 18. Revelation 22, verse 18. Notice what the Bible says. Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if, notice, if any man shall add unto these things, so someone adds to the books of God, to the Bible, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. What are those plagues? Hell, they come from hell. Read the book of Revelation. He opens up hell and all the plagues come out. Look at verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Now look, how do you get to heaven? By having your name in the book of life. He says, if you take away or add to the Bible, I will take your part. The place where your name would have gone if you got saved. Now look, this is not talking about losing your salvation. Once your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's there forever. No one can, no one can take it uh, uh, once you're saved. And by the way, no believer would ever mess with God's Word. But he says, if you're not saved and you remove from the Word of God or you add to the Word of God, he says, I will take away his part out of the Book of Life and out of the Holy City and from the things that are written in this book. So did he give up on these people? God never gives up on anybody. It looks like God gives up on a lot of people, actually. Because look, God extends His grace and gift of salvation to all mankind. But if you reject it enough, if you reject it enough, if you blaspheme His Holy Ghost, if you change His Word, if you cross certain lines, God says, you know what? You had a chance, but you shut your eyes, and now your chance is gone. And people get all uptight. Go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 28. I'm, you know, I want to show that to you about different people that aren't just the homos. Because some of you just, there's too much emotion just even bringing up the sodomites. Because you have initially, you start thinking about your neighbor and your coworker, whatever. Okay. Maybe you're not that close to the translators of the NIV, you know. But um, I want to show you that there's lots of examples where people, where God gives up on people, religious people. He gave up on them. Okay. And all, all we're saying, Romans 128, Romans 128, about the Sodomites, notice what the Bible says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, not that they didn't know God, they just didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. Notice God gave them over to a reprobate. He, before that, he says God gave them up, God gave them over, God gave them up. Now he says God gave them over to a reprobate. The word reprobate means rejected. You don't have to turn there, but jot this verse down. Jeremiah 6.30 says, Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Why would someone call you a reprobate? Because the Lord rejected you. All right? Rep he says, God gave him over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I was meeting with that liberal pastor at Capitol Christian Center. And I said, well, what do you, th you know, it says the word reprobate. How do you take that? He's like, well, we would have to go back and look at the Greek and figure out what the word reprobate means. I said, well, here's the problem with that. If you look at the word, the Greek word that's translated reprobate in our King James Bible, it's only used three times in the New Testament. And here's how it's translated every time. The first time, Romans 1.28, reprobate. The second time, 1 Corinthians 9.27, cast away. The third time, Hebrews 6.8, rejected. That's how the Greek word is translated. Cast away, thrown away, rejected, reprobate. What do you have to say to that, Capital Christian Center? Well, this conversation is no longer fruitful. <laughs> yeah, it's only fruitful if you're right. And, and, and here's the thing, these Christians, they're just, they, they got their little agenda, they're, you know, I can preach this and still be rich. I can preach this and still ride, drive a Bentley. I can preach this and still be on TV. Why don't you just preach the Bible? Why don't you just preach what God said when he gave up on the Pharisees, when he gave up on the Jews, when he gave up on those that would mess with his word, when he gave up on those that would take the mark of the beast, and he gave up on those who he gave over to a reprobate mind. That's what the Bible says. Well, all sin is equal. No, it's not. God never gives up on anyone. That's not true. God gives up on people sometimes. Let me give you the third one. You learn Romans? Go to chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. God loves everyone and hates no one. 
Pastor Matt, I can't believe you're preaching. Don't you know that God loves everyone and hates no one? Here's the, here's the problem with that. The Bible. Are you there in Romans? Look at chapter 9, look at verse 13. As it is written, you know where it's written? In the Bible. They're about to quote, they're about to quote the Bible. As it is written, Jacob have I loved. This is God speaking. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I what? God never hates anybody. Well, the problem with that is that the Bible says that Esau have I hated, and that's God speaking. Well, that's, that's only Esau. Okay, let's go to Psalms. Let's go to the book of Psalms. If you open up your Bible just right in the center, you're more than likely following the book of Psalms. Go to Psalm 5. And let, let's, let's run some verses. Let's look, let's look at some verses. You say, Pastor Jimenez, if you preach these sermons, your church is not going to grow. If you, if you have these beliefs, people aren't going to come here. Listen to me. I was preaching these things when we were in the living room, and it was me, my family, and, and two other people. Amen. You think I'm going to change now for some liberal that's going to quit on us anyway? Amen. You think I'm going to change now? I'm not ch look, look, let me, let me explain something to you. You want to understand how Pastor Jimenez is different than the average Christian? Here's how Pastor Jimenez is different than the average Christian. The average Christian takes this position. I believe this as long as nobody knows about it. But if people find out about it, I mean, if it gets all over the media, then I'm, you know, I never believe that anyway. Look, I believe it whether people know about it or not. Amen. I, don't, I don't make my decisions based on what society thinks about the Bible. I just decided I believe the Bible. Yeah. I believe what the Bible says. And if they don't like it, they can lump it. I'm going to believe the Word of God. And if, it's preach, if I'm just preaching to my wife and kids, then that's good enough. Amen. You know, I don't need a crowd. I don't need, and, and by the way, we have a crowd. But you know what? We're not here to build a church. Jesus builds the church. Amen. Psalm 5, look at verse 4. Psalm 5, 4. That, the, I met with that capital Christian thing. He's like, well, you know, he's one of his, let me give you, his, his number one reason why we're wrong. Most people disagree with you. Most, he's like, most pastors don't agree with you. Most theologians don't agree with you. I said, yeah, that sounds familiar. I think I read something about broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there at. Yeah, I think, I think that is a biblical principle. You're right. Psalm 5. Look at verse 5. Psalm 5, 5. Yeah, I don't think you should be talking about pastors by name. Then you don't do it when you're preaching. Here's another dumb thing that Christians believe. In the Bible, and I don't, I'll just give this one to you for free. In the Bible, you know that Paul and John called out people by name, false prophets by name? I just, you can study that one out on your own. Psalm 5. Look at verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. We're talking about God here. Notice what it says. Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. God hates no one. Well, he hates the workers of iniquity. Look at verse 6. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor. You know what the word abhor means? Hate. To loathe. To detest. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. God doesn't hate anybody. You know what? God does hate the bloody and deceitful man. God does hate the workers of iniquity. Go to Psalm 11. Look at verse 5. Psalm 11. You're there in Psalm 5? Just flip a few pages over. Psalm 11, verse 5. Psalm 11, verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous. The Lord trieth the righteous. Psalm 11, 5. But the wicked and him that loveth violence... His soul, whose soul, the Lord's soul, God, his soul hateth. God doesn't hate anybody. He hates that guy. He hates those people. The wicked and him that loveth violence, he hateth. The workers of iniquity, he hateth. He said, Jacob have I loved, loved and Esau have I hated. Go to the book of Hosea, Hosea uh, chapter 9. Uh, make sure you can keep your place in Psalms because we're going to come back to it. You should have your place in Acts and also in Psalms. We're going to come back to those two places. Go to Hosea 9 and look at verse number 15. Hosea. Now, Hosea is in the, uh, 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 minor, one of the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament. Let me help you out. You got the big books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Hosea. All right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Hosea. I want you to get there because I want you to see it. Because people say, well, God, God loves everyone and hates no one. The Bible doesn't teach that. And here's the whole, I'm not mad. You say, well, I, I believe that. I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying, you got to do something with the verses we're looking at. Because you can't look at the Bible and have the Bible say that he hates some people, and then you say, God hates no one. Because here's the thing. Either you're wrong or the Bible's wrong, and I'm going to bet it's probably you. Hosea 9, 
So, well, 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 I don't understand. Does God, I thought God loves everyone. Let, Hosea 9.15 kind of explains that. Let, let's look at it. Hosea 9.15. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For their I, this is God speaking, for their I hated them. Another verse. God hates those people. God loves everybody. No, no, he hates them. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. Now, don't miss this. Well, did God always hate them? No, he used to love them. Look, I will love them no more. Do you see that? I will love them no more. All their princes are revolted. People are like, well, what about John 3.16? For God so loved the world. Yeah, God, did love, God does love the world. God loves the entire world. God gave his son to die for the entire world. But there are some people that he loves, and he loves no more. Not that he always hated them. But they shut their eyes. They, they, they're, they're, they decided not to believe. They, they rejected him. And then God says, you know what? I did love you. You did have a chance for salvation. But I will love them no more. And then he says, for there I hated them. I, look, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to ruin your day. I'm just trying to... I, all, I just want you to answer me. What do you do with that? Well, no, I mean, my one friend or my cousin or my sister or my whatever... My grandpa, who's a preacher, and look, if you said that to me, I'm not, I'm not talking to anybody specific. I don't even, I, I'm just saying, they said God loves everyone and hates no one. I know, but what does the Bible say? They said God never gives up on anyone. I, I know, but what does the Bible say? They said all sin is equal. I know, but what does the Bible say? You're there in Psalms? Go to the book of Ecclesiastes. You're going to go past Proverbs into Ecclesiastes. Let me give you the fourth one. All right, I got five. I've got like 20, but I'll give you five today. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is a, is, a, is a really famous passage in Scripture. It's, one, it's a beautiful passage in Scripture. Oftentimes you'll see it like on, on cards and stuff that people give, give away. And here's the fourth statement for those of you taking notes. I said number one, all sin is equal. Stupid statement. I said number two, God never gives up on anyone. Stupid statement. Number three, God loves everyone and hates no one. Stupid statement. Here's the fourth statement. Christians should only love everyone and never hate anyone. They, they say, because God loves everyone and hates no one, then we as Christians should love everyone and hate no one. Well, number one, God doesn't love everyone and hates no one. There's some people that God used to love and doesn't love anymore, and now he hates them. I can't believe you say that. The Bible says that. But let me give you another one. You know, this idea that we should never hate anyone. Christians should only love and never hate anyone. Okay, are you there in Ecclesiastes? Remember this beautiful passage of Scripture? You, you, you read it on the Hallmark card? To everything there is a season. Isn't that beautiful? A a uh, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. You're like, oh, you're sounding more like Pastor Cole now. Great. Okay, look at verse 8. A time to love? Man, you sound just like, you know, the liberal I listen to on TV. And a time to hate. Well, wait a minute. They cut that one off of the Hallmark card. <laughs> Christians are never supposed to hate. Then why did God say that there's a time to hate? Amen. Christians are ne you're ne we're never supposed to hate. Then, then why did God say there's a time to love and there's a time to hate? A time of war and a time of peace. Well, we're never supposed to hate anybody. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at it. Now, make sure you're there in Ecclesiastes, okay? Make sure you can get back to Ecclesiastes Psalm. We're going to come right back to it. But let's look at Matthew 5. Because here's what people say. They'll say, well, Matthew 5 teaches you're never supposed to hate anybody. You're only supposed to love people. Okay, let's look at it together. Because here's the thing. I don't have a problem with Matthew 5. I love Matthew 5. I think Matthew 5 is great. I don't have a problem with any of the Bible. I'm not the liberal Christian that's cherry-picking which passages he wants to preach out of. Matthew 5, look at verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43. Matthew 5, 43. Notice what Jesus said. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And people say, Matthew 5, 44. I get all these voices. Matt, haven't you ever read Matthew 5, 44? No, I never got that far into the New Testament. <laughs> I, I read up to Matthew 5, 43. You just revolutionized my life. I never thought about that. I mean, what do these people want me to say? Okay, 
but I say unto you, like we've never thought about these verses, but I say unto you, love, here's the key word, you ought to underline this in your Bible, you ought to circle in your Bible, love your, love your, love your enemies. See, here's what the Bible says, if you are my enemy, I parked in your parking spot. I sat in your, you know, whatever. I was walking my dog and he went doo-doo on your lawn and I didn't pick it up. Whatever. And you hate me. You become my enemy. God commands me to love my enemies. Amen. That's why I love some of you guys because you guys just are my enemies. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're going to post all about it on change.org. <laughs> They're falling apart. Stupid. <laughs> Look, we're supposed to love our enemies. Absolutely, I believe that. Okay, but here's the thing. You know why those protesters out there hate us? You know why they hate us? They don't hate us because I cut them off. They don't hate us because of any personal interaction that we had with them. We don't even know those people. We've never met those people. I've never seen those people in my life. You know why they hate us? Because of what we believe. You know why they hate us? Because of what we preach. You know why they hate us? Because they hate God. That's why they hate us. They don't have a problem with us. I mean, six weeks ago, they might have been in front of me or behind me at the grocery store and it would have been like you know whatever yeah go ahead ma'am go ahead sir no problem between us and them but when they find out that we believe the word of God and they hate God so much and they're an enemy of God they hate us you say well we're supposed to love our enemies we're supposed to love those who are our enemies okay go to the book of Psalms Psalm 139 I'm about to mess you up with the Bible again Psalm 139 remember David the sweet psalmist of Israel the great the great psalm writer you love Psalm one, you know, 23. Okay, let's look at Psalm 139, verse 21. Psalm 139. We're, we're, we're almost done here. I, I, I think I, get, I told you I was going to do five points, but I, I'm only doing four. So you're, you're good. Psalm 139. You got to do something with this. You can't just ignore this. Do not I hate them, O Lord. Now look, are you about to tell me that David, the man after God's own heart, was sinning when he said, I hate them, Lord. Now notice, do not I hate them, O Lord. Notice, don't miss this, that hate thee, that hate who? The Lord. Look, David, if there's, a, if there's an example in the Bible of a man who loved his enemies, it's David. He had the opportunity twice to kill Saul and he chose not to. He, he, he could have he messed up Saul, but he didn't. You know why? Because he loved his enemies. But guess who David did not love? God's enemies. Amen. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? Don't miss this. Look at verse 22. I hate them. Notice, just to make sure you know he's right with God, he says, I hate them with a perfect hatred. The word perfect means complete. He said, there's nothing wrong with my hatred. This isn't a personal thing against me and them. He says, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Why aren't you supposed to love your enemies? Look, here's how it works. You're my enemy. I love you. You're God's enemy. I hate you. Do you understand that? Look, I'm supposed to love my enemies. Those people that hate me. But when you hate God, you're my enemy now. I stand with God. I stand with Orlando. I stand with God. <laughs> I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. And then just to make sure you know what he's saying is right, notice what he says in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. He says, look at my heart. There's nothing wrong with my heart. Look at me. I'm not doing anything wrong. But I hate those who hate thee. We're never supposed to hate. Oh, really? The Bible says there's a time to hate. Or well, you're supposed to love your enemies. I, I do my best to love my enemies. I do my best to love those who hate me for whatever. But when you hate God, when the only reason you have a beef with me is because of the word of God, then your, your problem's not with me, your problem's with God. You're an enemy of God, and you're not my enemy. Now what are we going to do? We're going to go out there and squirt them with water guns? No. <laughs> We're just going to preach the Bible. You say, well, what, what's the problem with the, with the homo agenda? You don't have to turn there. Romans 1.30 says this, they are backbiters, they are haters of God. That's what God says. That, look, their issues not with me. Their issues with God. Their issues with me because I'm. It's like when you get mad at the mailman for bringing you the credit card bill. <laughs> he, he didn't charge up the credit card bill. He's not the credit card company. You're mad at the mailman for bringing you the news. 
They're, they're not mad at us. They don't hate us. They hate God. Right. You say, do you hate them? I hate them with a perfect hatred. You say, I, well, do you want, I, I'm, look, here's what I'm, I'm praying, that they get saved, that they leave or die. I don't think here's the Read the book of Psalms. They, I mean, there's some prayers in the book of Psalms where David is praying that, that God would knock out and break out their teeth. That's what the Bible says. You say, well, I just don't know that. Here's the here's here's problem you have. You have a problem with the Bible. And you've made up this Christianity that's just not real. Go to 2 uh, uh, Chronicles ch chapter 19. We'll, we'll finish up right here. 2 Chronicles 19. 2 Chronicles 19, verse 22, verse 2. 2 Chronicles 19 and verse 2. If I don't continue the series on stupid things Christians believe next week, I'm probably going to be preaching from the life of Jehu. So we're going to look at one verse out of Jehu right now. 2 Chronicles 19. If you can find the first and second books, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 19, look at verse 2. Notice what Jehu said. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? That's the question I want to ask to most Christians today. Shouldest thou help the ungodly? I had the, the treasure. You say, I don't think you should call out names. The treasurer from the crossing came to talk to me about how we can smooth out these relationships. Then I watch a video of him protesting us on the day of the big protest. Here's a question I have for them. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Look, when you line yourself up with God's enemies, the wrath of God is going to be upon you. And we're not talking about hell if you're saved, but the Bible is very clear that if you line yourself with those who are enemies of God, then you put yourself at enmity with God. Look, you... You, are we going to go do something? I've, I've never said that. We're never going to do that. That's not the point. The point is this. Should Christi Christians should love everyone and hate no one. That's, that is not found in the Bible. That is not found in, script in Scripture. You say, well, why, why are there... And I'm not going to take them to do it because I'm, I'm out of time. You say, but why are there so many errors in Christianity today? Why are so many churches teaching false doctrines? Here's, here's why. And I won't take the time to do it. I've done it before. Whenever the Pharisees bring up a false doctrine to Christ, over and over and over in the Bible, you know what he says to them? He says, ye do err not knowing the scriptures. He said, you, you're in error because he said, have you not read over and over? I mean, just read it in, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll, you'll find Jesus questioning the very thing. Have you not read? He said, didn't you read? Don't you know? You know what the problem with why most Christians believe these stupid things? All sin is equal. God never gives up on anyone. God loves everyone and hates no one. Christians should never love everyone, should love everyone and hate no one. You know why people believe that? Because they don't read the Bible. That's why. Amen. And because they go to churches where the Bible's not being preached. So here's a question I have for you. Have you not read? I gave you a lot of verses. You should jot them down. If you have a question about what I'm preaching, come talk to me. I'd be happy to answer it for you. Or read it and study it out for yourself. But be ready to have an answer. When your friends come to you, when your cousins come to you, when your aunts and uncles or whoever comes to you and says, well, what about, you know, I thought Christians were supposed to love. And some of them, look, I'm not mad at these people. Some of them are genuine people. They've never learned. You know, they say, well, I thought Christians were never supposed to love. Doesn't the Bible supposed to love our enemies? Say, hey, yeah, let me, let me, you want me to explain that to you? The Bible says we're supposed to love our enemies, but let me show you. Someone, 139 says that we're supposed to not love the enemies of God. Have an answer. Look, I'm not, I don't just get up here and just say whatever and, well, pastor just kind of went on that rant again and they happen to get it on the news. No, I thought about what I believed before I spoke. I did the reading before I preached. I figured out what the, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I make mistakes. I had, I, 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 somebody said to me, I think it was Miss Tracy, said, Pastor, I went back, she, she said she either went back and listened to the very first sermon or one of the first sermons of our church's existence. And they're like, you're preaching the exact same thing? Right then, listen to me, listen to me. I haven't changed. Our doctrinal statement has said the same thing for five years. Many of you, many of you sat in a uh, uh, striving together class where we read the doctrinal statement, went over the doctrinal statement, and asked you if you understand and acknowledge this to sign it. And you did, as long as the media wasn't watching. <laughs> but as soon as everybody knows, then I don't know, I never, well, then why do you sign the statement? 
I'm not, look, I'm not saying you have to believe everything we believe. I don't, you, I don't think you have to come to our church to believe everything we believe. That's not what the point of the statement is. The point of the statement is for you to acknowledge what we believe. We're not hiding anything. We're shouting it from the rooftops. We've, we haven't changed what we believe. Nothing's changed at Verity Baptist Church over the last five and a half years. I don't understand where all the problem was. I don't know about what you... It's funny, you, knew, you didn't say anything about it last year when I preached the sermon. But Terry said to me, I listened to the sermon about the sodomites you preached a year. He said almost a year ago. It was almost word for word the same sermon. I'm like, brother, don't tell people that. I'm just taking the old sermons and re-preaching them. You know what I mean? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Why don't you decide what you believe? Why don't you do the reading? Do the homework. Figure it out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able to gather together. Lord, help us to...